and we are live what's happening everyone welcome back to the punch perfect boxing channel before we get going today please make sure to hit the like button comment your thoughts down below and please subscribe to the channel today i'm delighted to welcome back mr adeola depot how are you doing sir not bad not bad man thanks for thanks for having me thank you for um being patient with me in terms of coming on we should have done this a while back uh just been super busy as you know but it's always great to come on your channel you know i've been following you for a while now so it's just good to be able to kind of just uh you know have a little chit chat about what's going on in boxing world exactly yeah well, i appreciate you coming on i'll leave a link down below to our day's channel i'm sure most people have seen it already but i'll leave a link down below so people can go over just wanted to say really before we get into it congrats on everything man because the the last few months have been a been a whirlwind sort of following you let alone actually being you i can imagine mm. so last time i had you on was end of august i think and i think you just wow. started doing the design stuff at that point because i remember we were talking about warrington and yeah. you hadn't even experienced that yet and i think that was the first Jeez. sort of real big one for you so yeah it's been a been a crazy couple of months so congrats on it cheers my man yeah it's been it's, it has been crazy sometimes um you don't take it in because you're just going from one job you to the other it, job yeah. and you feel like you don't really kind of sit back and like just soak it all up a bit you know you're doing big events you're doing you know quote unquote smaller events i went to barcelona mm -hmm. obviously i just spoke to you just now and said i'm going to be able to i'm going to america for canelo and katie taylor and that's just all a bit it's all a bit crazy so i'm gonna just there is gonna be a couple of weeks where i just don't do anything and just <laughs> have a drink on a sunny beach somewhere and just say okay sometimes you do have to pat yourself on the back you know you, you know without sounding sort of egotistical sometimes you have to kind of say okay look, well done you know you've tried and you keep pushing and pushing a couple of setbacks but you just keep going through them so yeah thank you i really appreciate that no, absolutely. Keep smashing it, mate. I'm sure it's going to get bigger and bigger with the schedule that, that's coming our way. Obviously, mm. the main bulk of today is going to be around Fury versus White. I did just quickly want to have a quick discussion, really, on the weekend. Obviously, you were there yeah. working for DAZN and, and having a chat with Conor Ben afterwards and stuff. I just really wanted to to kind of get your thoughts on it. You, obviously, you did, a, you did a great interview on your channel speaking with Conor Ben, and I've said to you away from this that you know, it, it kind of made me really like Conor Ben because he wasn't mm. riled up and trying to make weight and he isn't angry and being asked dumb <laughs> questions that sort of get him on edge. He was he was relaxed. He felt comfortable around you and it's nice to see that side of him. Mm. But obviously, a lot of people now are kind of looking for the, the next fight to see if the, all, the, all the talk that we're getting is really true. And yeah. I had an awful lot of back and forth on, on Twitter on Saturday night with some people because of my thoughts on it. But I kind of like to know where, where you stand on it and how you're feeling about Conor Ben at this point. You're not strange. I will, I'll definitely give you my point of view. But I remember after the show, so we do the Beyond the Bell um, thing with... <laughs> For the zone and I was doing it with Andy Lee, Maxi Hughes, and Josh Warrington. So, sort of two. I, I don't. I don't know if you count the IBO as a world title, but let's just say two former world. Mm -hmm. Sorry, two world champions and a former world champion. And I was like, look, guys, surely Connor has to go now. Sort of top ten, top fifteen, and all of them were like, mm, not quite sure. And I'm like, what do you mean, not sure? Like, surely he has to go. So, I think they're seeing something with a boxing eye that maybe we're not, where they want to see him in there with someone that kind of really pushes, someone that is youthful, energetic. Someone maybe around his own age that has no wear and tear before you sort of top, before you kind of dip your toes into that sort of top 10, top 15. I, on the other hand, just want to see him go now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not saying go and, you know, Jaron Ennis talk or, or Ugas even, although he's coming off a defeat. I'm not saying that. But I think the Avenesian one, like every time in a boxer's career, there is that kind of roll of the dice fight where it's, it's not make or break, but we see what you've got. Mm -hmm. And Avenesian, like, is in his mid 30s, he's the European champion. That's a good matchup. I'm not having the, the talk from Eddie Hearn that he does no tickets. Van Heerden does no tickets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not, it's not Algeria does no tickets. Formella doesn't. I know that's behind closed doors, but he would have done no tickets as well. So I do think it's a good matchup. Um, I prefer that to the Mikey Garcias. And I think Danny's too risky. I think Danny Garcia still got a lot left. Um, I do, especially when you see how Errol dealt with Odinus Ugas and you kind of think what well, Danny done with, against Errol so mm -hmm. I don't know I don't mind an Avenesian fight and I feel like if I'm Connor I almost want to shut a few people up like you, you, you don't think I'm European level okay let's do the Avenesian fight but I'm not quite sure Eddie's going to do it I feel like Eddie might go the Mikey Garcia route it was interesting what you say about Josh Warrington and Maxi Hughes because actually on the the after fight as well with Bellew and Froch they were both quite similar actually and mm -hmm. Tony Bellew often he's very passionate and he he will sort of encourage a fighter taking that next step and he likes to he likes to hype up the matchroom stable but he was actually sort of pumping the brakes on probably even more so than Froch so it's definitely 
we may be seeing that, that boxers are thinking that. For me, the Avenetian fight, what you just said, is perfect. Yeah. And I do think Eddie Hearn has slightly lost touch of what really matters in boxing. Because when I go on Twitter and I have a scroll through, when I read my YouTube comments, when I have chats with people, everyone wants to see the Avenetian fight. No one wants to see him in with Adrian Broner at this stage. No one wants yeah. to see him in with Mikey at this stage. Danny and Keith and people like that, they're very, very hard to try and prize away from PBC because they will always get paid well to fight lesser guys like a Barrios or someone like that. Yeah. So I don't think they're feasible either. I just think that Eddie Hearn perhaps not seeing something that's right in front of him that is in fact really good. And I think he has a very valid point about the the Mets fight the other week for Avenetian, the Liam Taylor fight, really poorly promoted and Avenetian deserves better than that. But I think the Conor Ben fight is the thing that is better for them. And it's not a crazy dangerous matchup. Don't get me no. wrong. Avenetian's good, but let's put it into pers you know, perspective. When he has jumped up to world level against Mean Machine, who is someone that himself, when he jumps up to the elite level, loses, you know, Avenetian has lost those fights. So mm. I do think that Eddie's perhaps not seeing what we, we all really want to see at this stage. So much like you, I think that Avenetian fight should be next. Is that kind of what you what you feel as well? Yeah, I mean, you can't blame Avenetian for having sort of a, you know, poorly promoted fights. That That's mm -hmm. not his job. His job is to go in there and fight. He's not a, a Conor McGregor that's going to sell tickets. And, you know, let's, he's not from the UK. Yeah. And he's fighting in the UK. So it's always going to be difficult. I mean, unless you've got a Florian Marcou type following, then you're never, as a non-Brit, sort of Brit, going to sell tickets in Britain. It's just not going to work. Yeah. But Avenician's a good name. It's a good fight. And again, look, there's a risk-reward factor with this. The risk is you lose. And, mm -hmm. and then, obviously, then you have to start kind of building Conor Ben from scratch. But for me, Conor Ben was never going to be a fighter that was going to go unbeaten throughout his career. Mm -hmm. He isn't that. So he's going to taste a defeat sometime. There's no shame in losing to an Avenician. But I think Avenician's there for the taking. I think maybe yeah. some fight fans have looked at the Josh Kelly performance and think, oh, okay, no, Conor's way off that. I watch Conor and I genuinely believe, and I'm not saying this as a the zone match from worker. I look at him and I think he's such, he's so improved from what he was 18 months ago. It's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. But I would never think this is a guy that had, what, 16, 17 amateur fights. He's really, really good. He's strong. He's powerful. He's fast. He closes the distance. I think it's a close matchup. And if I'm Eddie, it's one that I do. It's one that I think sells out the O2 arena just because everyone's talking about it. And I think, Connor's starting to grow that fan base as well now. So for me, it's the perfect matchup. I would have said a Kel Brook, just yeah. because the Kel Brook makes sense because, you know, past champion, old, coming back to fight the young, hungry lion. But I think Brook's going to go Eubank. So mm -hmm. for me, the only route to go without getting complaints from fans is the Avenician route. Everything else is going to have a problem. Yeah, I completely agree with you. That That's exactly how I feel about it. And like you said, the... The sort of Avenetian isn't a name thing. A lot of people that I consider to be casual fans actually know more about Avenetian because yeah. of the Kelly fight than they do. And listen, Danny Garcia and Keith Furman, they're decent names in America, but even them over here to casual audiences aren't known because they predominantly fought over in America. So I think Avenetian is is mm. the is the route to go down but mm. yeah we'll get into the the main part of the show that we want to discuss it is fight week i've seen a lot of uh posts from bt sport and everything this week finally it, yeah it feels like it's it's actually here now after all the doubts all the back and forth all the the radio silence as well from white it feels like it's actually happening just first and foremost how excited are you and what plans have you made for it so far dude ridiculously excited i'm like most I was skeptical, you know, I went to the first press conference and there was no Dillian White. I spoke to Frank, I spoke to Tyson Fury and look, Tyson Fury, very confident, but Frank had the kind of look in his eye, like this could go sideways. We actually don't know what's going on here. And then I, and I was actually in the TalkSport Talk studio when Frank kind of went back and forth with Dillian White's lawyer, Jeffrey Benz. And I was like, okay, something's going on here. And then we've had the recent incident with, you know who, and I'm not going to really mention that on your channel, but mm -hmm. there's so much going on. And I was thinking, okay, this fight could collapse now where we were, what, five, six days away, it's on, and I, I can't wait for it. Honestly, the appetite, and I keep saying this, just to kind of nail it in, the appetite for boxing in this country is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, 94,000, and it's not AJ? Like, you would, if you would have told me that a couple of years ago, I said, you're mad. That like only AJ can do 90 plus thousand. The fact that it's not AJ shows that we have superstars in this country. We just need to kind of promote and build them right. I think mm -hmm. Fury's gone away. He's become a superstar. He's come back. He is one. And Dillian White's almost got this, he likes playing the bad man in these, 
Like he, he's almost a heel in this and he loves it. He doesn't mind playing the heel. And I, I can't wait for it. I'm going to do a live watch along. I was going to go there. But you know, I thought, you know what? Let me just do a live watch long in the studio as opposed to go there. I'm probably going to regret it if I'm honest with you because, you know, 94,000 at Wembley is a once in a lifetime thing. But I'm going to do a live watch long, enjoy it. I'm not too happy about the undercard, but the main event makes up for it. Yeah, well, I think you can enjoy fights the most often when you when you're sat in your own comfort yes. and able to to get into it as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you've actually seen Tyson Fury. I know you saw him at the uh, the announcement press conference, and I saw you did something else separately where you recorded with him as well. Yeah. So you've had you've had some FaceTime with him, and mm. just my kind of personal observations is I think he looks really trim. I think he looks really defined, sort of you know in in the, in the face and stuff doesn't look podgy quite like he did in the Wilder third fight. Yeah. Um, I think the same for for Dillian White as well but just listening to them both they both seem really happy and relaxed and calm and neither of them seem particularly pent up and angry at this point even Dillian White on Thursday or whenever it was when he did the Zoom call just seemed to sort of laugh everything off seemed quite relaxed how do you think sort of both of them are feeling and having sort of seen Tyson how do you think he's sort of feeling heading into this one yeah look Tyson's super confident and, and like when I spoke to Tyson I said do you not are you not upset that you hadn't had a chance to kind of play the mind games and he's like, no, not really. Obviously, look, he famously did it with Vladimir Klitschko and he certainly did it with Deontay Wilder. But I think that takes a lot of effort from him as well. Yeah, I think all the chat and having to think of those one-liners, I think he's almost happy that he's not had to do any of that. There's nothing. So always focused on his training. Yes, he's done his little bit of press conference. And yes, I've seen him. You're right. And he does look lean in the face. But I think he's okay to kind of just go away. He'll be nervous. This is his first fight in the UK for years. Mm -hmm. 94,000. It's a guy that... We know hurt him in sparring. He'll be a bit nervous about it. But right now, he also knows he's the best heavyweight on the planet by a bit, a bit of a distance. Uh, for Dillian White, this is everything you wanted. You waited for this opportunity. And it's even better now than what you thought it would be. It's it's in your hometown. It's the number one heavyweight. Like, there's no arguments. If, if he were going to fight, AJ would have been an argument. There is none. And you've got the WBC title up for grabs as well. And you're making 8 million plus mm -hmm. another four if you win. So for Dillian White, you've got everything you wanted. So look, both should be confident. And I think both feel like they've got the beating of the other. Again, Tyson Fury, you have to make as a favourite. But Dillian White's not afraid of Tyson Fury at all. And he's probably thinking, I'm a better boxer than Deontay Wilder. If Deontay Wilder can at stages, you know, get to you and close the distance, I can as well. So I think both will be confident. And I think both are going to make for, and I think, honestly, I think this is going to be a bit special. On yeah. I, I think Tyson Fury might have to get up with his backside. I think Dylan White might have to go for his backside as well. I think we've got a really, really special heavyweight fight. Yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. What have you made of Dillian White's kind of radio silence? There's been very different opinions on it and stuff. And for me, I kind of, uh, in the Wilder third fight, I actually said that I thought Wilder did the right thing by putting the headphones on and not really trying to get engaged because you're just never going to win a, a war of words. And someone like White that's quite hot-headed, it doesn't take much for him to get going. I kind of have, have sort of understood why he's maybe been quiet. And do I think the promotion at times has suffered? Has it caused a lot of doubts for us uh, in terms of it actually happening? Yes. But ultimately, we've got to fight week now. They managed to sell 94,000 without White really taking part in the promotion and stuff. It sold itself. What was your kind of reaction to it all when he wasn't coming out and speaking to us? Um, a, a bit indifferent, a bit disappointed for his fans mm -hmm. more than anyone, just because his fans want to hear from him again. This is a Dillian White that's campaigned for his WBC shot now for three years, right? Or well, that's what we're led to believe anyway. So now you've got it. Surely there should be something, an announcement. Like, fans, we got what we wanted. I'm ready to go. I'm just going to disappear for a little while. I just want to go to, you know, incognito mode and just do what i got to mm -hmm. do. So I wouldn't have mind a bit of that. Um, you're right. He's never going to win a war of words with, with um, Tyson Fury, but that's at a press conference. Now that's done, surely you want to kind of put something out there on social media. Um, those people like myself thinking, is the fight going to happen just because mm -hmm. Dylan White wasn't speaking? So look, I get why he's gone silent and there's probably something contractually there as well where his managers have said, okay, if they're not going to give you this, then don't do anything. But I think for a, from a fan's perspective, I would want to hear from a fighter that I'm supporting or a mm -hmm. fighter that I want to win or enjoy watching. And I think that's my only disappointing factor with it. I, look, the biggest thing is Saturday night. No one's going to care about any press conferences, any sort of media thing once they get in the ring you forget all about it but i sometimes feel like fights like this need to be built up you think of even conor mcgregor floyd mayweather and this is a random thing but those are the two biggest names at the time in combat sports they didn't need to do a free city press tour they didn't mm -hmm. need to go 
go all over the world. It would have sold anyway, but they chose to do it just to get the fans a bit more, get you excited, get the juices flowing a bit. Um, and I think that's the disappointing thing because I feel like you could have done a couple of press conferences with these two. I think they honestly, they would have worked like a, a hand in glove. It would have worked so well. But at the same time, I'm with you. It happens on Saturday. So, and by the time Saturday comes around, I'm not going to care. But I do think fights of this magnitude deserve a bit more build up. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the biggest British heavyweight fight since Lewis and Bruno. In fact, I think it's bigger than that. So it deserves a bit more. Yeah, definitely. I get you. Um, let's talk about Saturday. It's going to come around very soon. I've done a prediction video on my channel where I spoke about it. And I actually think uh, what makes this fight interesting is I think both of them are going to revert to type a little bit. Yeah. Um, and yeah. kind of what, what I mean by that is Dillian White of late has kind of boxed more on the back foot. And don't get me wrong, it's invited his, you know, his fair share of uh, scary moments. He was hurt against Parker, hurt against Rivas, obviously knocked out against Povetkin. Uh, Tyson Fury in his last two fights has been solely preparing to go after Deontay Wilder, which isn't his usual style. So I think Tyson Fury is going to be lighter on his feet, back to the old Tyson Fury that was sort of yeah. boxing more off the back foot. And Dillian White's going to go back to the old Dillian White that just seek and destroy and is going to try and make this uncomfortable as possible and try and land on the on the awkwardness of, uh, of Tyson Fury. How are you going to sort of thinking you're going to see it play out this Saturday night? It, exactly the way you just said it, if I'm honest with you, Jay. I think like um, Tyson Fury looks lighter. Mm -hmm. He looks a lot lighter, actually. Uh, uh, Tyson Fury is a weird one because when he wears his clothes, he looks tall and lean. He takes his top he off. It's trim, belly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it doesn't make sense. Like, where's his belly just come from? Like, what was you breathing in all the time? <laughs> so I, I, I never know if he's lighter until I see him on weigh in day. But just going from some of the images we've seen, some of the photos, he looks lighter, which to me suggests he's going to be a bit like like he did against Derek Chisora a second time round, where he can engage if he wants to, but he moves around and he really busted up Chisora that fight. And if Dillian White is going to almost go just full gun blazing at him, I, I feel like Tyson Fury is too good for that. Mm -hmm. I feel like he is. I think that's the only way Dillian White can win, don't get me wrong. But Dillian White's going to be hoping that Tyson Fury engages. If Tyson Fury doesn't engage and he just boxes, let's be brutally honest here. Dillian White's not a great boxer. At mm -hmm. all, in fact, he's not. He's not at all. There's levels that separate them when it comes to boxing ability. But I want to see, from a fan's perspective, Tyson Fury engage. But I do think we are going to see the Fury that fought Chisora and the Fury that fought Klitschko. And if we do see that, then Fury could make this easy and boring. He, he really could. If we get to see a bit of the Fury that came against Deontay Wilder second time round, then any anything could happen. Honestly, we saw him get hit more than he's ever been hit before. Uh, Dillian White, we know, has got a really good left hook, good right to the body. That might slow the legs down of Fury. Look, Fury, as much as he moves and he, you know, he, he moves more than any other heavyweight, he started slowing down a lot recently. He doesn't move anymore like he used to. He gets involved now. And I don't think that's because he wants to. I think that's because his legs and the way he's abused his body over the years is starting to really come to him. Um, he got hit a lot against Wilder as well. Will that play effect on Saturday night? I, I don't think this is the best Fury we're seeing right now. I just feel like the people that he's fighting, he's just so much better than them, which is mm -hmm. why I can't wait to see like an Usyk matchup because I think Usyk will then show that there's a lot more to, to boxing than what Fury's doing. But for now, I think Fury's just levels above Dillian White. Yeah, have you, have you kind of had any sort of concern or doubts about the legs of Fury? Because that's something that I think has been a prominent talking point in the build-up, obviously. Coming down in weight for this fight, and like you said, how he's abused his body over the years. A lot of people say about, you know, how amazing that comeback was and to come mm. from whatever weight he was and lose all that weight. It, it was amazing that he was able to do that, but he was still a young man at the time and yes. you can fluctuate in weight and it doesn't impact you enough. It's when you get into your into your sort of middle 30s and then that's where it will start to show and it could just happen overnight for Tyson Fury could be this mm. fight could be three four fights down the line we won't know but he yeah. could just look really bad at one point and in the Wilder fight I do think he was just a bit nonchalant I do think he went in there with a bit less of a game plan and a little less disregard you know regard yeah. for actual Wilder's power but there were some signs that perhaps physically maybe not at his peak anymore is that something that you've definitely thought about heading into this one? Yeah, I, I have. And you mentioned sort of the comeback and when he was so big and, you know, then came back and fought Sefer Safiri and Pianeta. That was four years ago. Yeah. So he was a younger guy. He's just, he, he was, he was able to do that now. 
and, and I don't look at Fury and I could be wrong here, completely wrong, but I, I never look at Fury and think this is a guy that in between boxing lives the perfect life. <laughs> you know, I don't think, you know, like can eats like a vegan. I just don't think that's him. I think he does still to a lesser extent, but still does abuse his body. He's not a Bernard Hopkins that you know, would have yeah. ice baths at nine o'clock in the evening and go to bed. I don't look at Fury like that. And the fluctuation in weight as well. Sometimes he looks really big. Sometimes he looks really lean, then big, then lean. So, so you do wonder if that will catch up with you. And it will, but when? Um, could Dillian White be the man to make it make him pay? I'm, I'm not sure. For Dillian White, he's had that little long time out of the ring as well. I don't know if that's a benefactor. I saw a benefiting factor that he didn't fight Otto Volin, or has he had too long out of the ring? Is he going to look really rusty? Is he going to look tired? Like every time I see Dillian White, for some reason, he's blowing out of his ass after three rounds. He like, looks yeah. shattered all the time. He finds his second win, but he always looks shattered. But back to Fury, I haven't thought... I, I don't think we've seen Fury with good movement for a while, if I'm honest with you. Like, Deontay Wilder's movement is so bad, it might make Fury look so good. And I just wonder if the legs are still there. Like when he engaged Wilder the second time round, sometimes I think he had to because the legs aren't what they used to be. Look, we'll find out. We'll find out on Saturday if they are because Dylan White will make him move because Dylan White will literally go straight to him and then we'll see what legs he has left. Yeah, we're, we're going to find out. I wanted to, uh, before we sort of wrap up on the fight, I kind of want to know, do you have a do you have a horse in this race? Are you, is there someone that you're sort of secretly rooting for? Are you someone that... You know, you want Fury to win because it will lead to the best fights in the division and we want to see those. Or are you someone that likes a bit of chaos? You know, in the heavyweight division, when one of these results happens and everything's in disarray for a while, we might get some weird fights off the back of it and it could throw things up in the air after such a long time. I are you kind of... a bit of chaos, you know, in this one. Yeah. I, I'm actually, it's one of the fights where first time I can watch a heavyweight fight without a dog in it. But mm -hmm. Obviously, everyone knows my love for AJ and wanting AJ to win these fights. But this one... I'm kind of split. I, I feel mm. like, you know, that this really could throw a spanner in the works if, if Dillian White were to win this one. But then it also, I guess, would throw the argument back that it is a good division. Like everyone obviously wants Fury AJ or U Fury Usyk. There are other fighters in the division. I, I really do believe that, you know, you chuck in a Hergovic, you might even chuck in a Tony Yoka or a Joe Joyce. I think there are six or seven guys that could mix it well with each other. And I just want White to show that that statement's true. Um... Look, do I want ultimately an undisputed by the end of the year? I'd love that. I would. But I also know that if White wins, that means there are other exciting fights as well to be had. So, yeah, no dog in a fight. I, I will make Fury a sort of 70-30 favourite. I think mm -hmm. he deserves that. Uh, maybe even a bit more, if I'm honest with you. Yep. I expect him to win. Um, and look, I still harbour ambitions <clears throat> to see Fury AJ just because I want boxing to be as big as it can be. I want it to be front page news. And there's no fight in this country that makes it front page news if it's not Fury AJ. I mean, that could, I mean, they said there were nearly 200,000 people waiting for tickets for this one. There could be, I'm not even joking, I think there could be half a million mm -hmm. online waiting for tickets for Fury AJ. So if that's the fight I want, but I don't mind a bit of chaos, a bit of shock factor. Mm -hmm. And fingers crossed we get it on Saturday. We need it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just finally, you know, the undercard has been yeah. another talking point where a lot of people are, are disappointed. And don't get me wrong, I'm disappointed, but I didn't expect it to be particularly good either. The one thing I did expect was at least names. Like, mm. you at least get, like, a, I know Jared Anderson's in, injured, but you get those type of names where they're at least in showcase bouts, where you get to see their talent. Yeah. It doesn't even feel really like we got that. But when you sell 80,000 tickets before announcing an undercard... The, the, the pressure then on the promoter to actually deliver a good one really isn't there, unfortunately. Um, I said the same thing with Joshua Usyk, where they, they sold that out straight away. So then, don't get me wrong, Hearn says it was a good undercard. For me, it wasn't. But just the the kind of, I don't think it really was, anyone... Yeah, the Joshua Usyk one, I agree. It wasn't, it wasn't for boxing fans. And obviously, you're a hardcore boxing fan. It wasn't the best undercard. But it had the names... Against, showcase bouts, showcase like, names. Yeah, so you had Lawrence Okoli. Yes, not a great fight. But you had Callum Smith. Not a great fight. But you had the names. So I was like, okay. So if you're a casual fan, all you see is Callum Smith and Okoli. You're like, oh, okay, he stacked the undercard. And we haven't done like I say we. Um, Frank hasn't done that at all. <laughs> and I like a Kakache. I think Anthony. I see. I think Kakache is fantastic. Yeah. But again, like, give us a name. This is supposed to be a showcase, top rank and Queensbury event. Why have we not got no Americans over here? Like, why are we not showcasing some young American talents? I don't, I don't, mm. I don't understand. Well, I do understand. All the money's gone on the main event, and there's just no money um, yeah. for the, for the undercard, and that's what it is. But 
how Anthony Yard isn't on this card, even in an eight-rounder against anyone. Just get him on the card so we can say, oh, Yard's on the card. And you get a bit of a Yard Tunde at a press conference calling someone out or something. I feel like uh, Frank's missed a, a big opportunity here. I really do. Um, there's a, there's an undercard press conference, I think, on Thursday. And I think, who's going to go to that? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, what is an undercard media workout? Like, what? Yeah. I feel like they've missed out on this one. And if I'm a Queensbury fighter, I'm knocking on his door saying, I don't want to be on this card. It's the biggest fight card in years. I want to be on it. And obviously no one's done that. So it's disappointing. Yeah, but even like Dennis McCann fought the other week on one of his smaller shows that was in front of nobody, and you think that he's one of their best, be better prospects that they'd want to get out there. So, and it's not about they had Nathan Heaney on the weekend just just yeah. a few days ago, and look, Nathan Heaney's limited, and look, but he sells a lot of tickets, and you put him in there against someone of note, and you got the Stoke fans there, and it's it's something like just give us anything, Frank, and he's given us nothing, and he tried to come on Talk Sports and. These are 50-50 fights and blah, blah, blah. He said Joe Joyce is injured and Joe's not. I know that for a fact. Things like that. It's like, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, thank you very much for, for talking about that, Ade. Just before I let you go, I have to ask you this because you anything, did... we got, we got you, time. we still got time. You did the face-off, the gloves are off or kind of what it's called with, with Boazzi versus Richards. I'm actually going to the fight. So yeah. I am looking forward to it. I did say that... I'm slightly disappointed just in terms of Joshua Boazzi's career that this, that Craig Richards is such an important fight for him at this stage. Okay, that makes sense. Like, yeah. Because just six years on from the Olympics, I thought Joshua Boazzi was going to be far and away further yeah. than where he is now. So mm -hmm. that part disappoints me. But I can't help but seeing two South London guys, Boazzi, that I know for a fact, having watched him since the amateurs, has a spiteful demon in him that Mate. he doesn't want to let out. But when he does, it... it I dies. saw a bit of it. Yeah. And Craig Richards is is one of the nicest guys ever, but he seems to have like a, a sort of good wind-up in him as well that could probably mm -hmm. just knows the trigger for that. What was it like sort of being face-to-face? -face? And was it was it kind of... Was it was there tension there? Was it, was it awkward? Big time. Big time. I, I, like, it's weird because when they... So I, I'm, I'm sitting on the table first and I've got to call Boazzi over. I've got to call Richards over. And as soon as I call them both over, I, I was waiting for the minute where they, because they, so they come over and they're, they're still quite nervous. Obviously, I, I can understand that. So they look at me and they're both looking at me saying, hi, Ade, hi. And then they look at each other. Mm -hmm. And it's only for about five seconds, but that little eye, that eye's locked. Yeah. And I was like, here we go. And I was like, okay, this is gonna, this could go anywhere. And then like Richard started saying like, Boatsy's fought no one. Like every time Boatsy fights, he's a big time favorite and blah, blah, blah. He's been helped from his Olympic career. And that literally just turns Rick Boazzi into something I've never seen. Mm -hmm. Everyone talks about his spitefulness. Like, you know, he can't, you know, he plays this kind of nice, you know, church God-fearing character quite well. But if you want to bring out the devil in him, it's there. And then he turned on me <laughs> and said, people like Ade, who said, you know, last time I fought, I was lucky. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, is this live? What, what, what do we do here? So it, it he was riled up big time. And um, yeah, I spoke to Matchroom the other day, like, when are they going to release it? Um, they said they're going to release it sort of fight week. But I'm okay. telling you now, it's worth a watch because I think Craig Richards got under his skin. And I think we saw a side of Boatsy that everyone's been waiting to see, wanting to see. And even Eddie came up to me and said, you've done a good job because, you know, it's difficult to get Boatsy to show emotion. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it wasn't really me. It was Richards going straight at him. I kind of just stood back and was like, let them guys go. Um, but it's funny because what I was thinking as I was doing it, obviously, look, Johnny Nelson's the goat at it. Like, he's really good. He's perfect. And I was thinking, I don't know how Johnny Nelson did it when uh, Chisora threw water over White. Mm -hmm. Because even just me being around Boatsy and Richards, they're big guys. And I was, I was a bit intimidated by it. And I was thinking, I can't imagine what it's like being around two 20 stone bulls and they just go at each other. Mm -hmm. um, but look, I was... I don't know why Matram asked me to do it, but I, I'm thankful they did. And it was, it was fun. It was fun. Oh, I'm really excited to see it because I've always known that Boatsy has that side to him ever since the amateurs. There were a couple yeah, of fights I watched in some international tournaments where things weren't quite going his way and the shots he would throw out of spite. And it was almost a bit like a, a petulant child sometimes at points. Like he would get that angry and frustrated. And it mm. reminds me a little bit of Anthony Joshua early on where you know, you know deep down that it, that he's he can be really angry and spiteful, but he's not showing it because he wants to 
Got off that's a good so image. interesting that you say that because I thought, and that's very, very true. Like with AJ now, and, and this is such a good point you make with AJ, they've almost tried to make him so technical. So everything's perfect. I want to watch AJ now. I remember AJ a year ago, there's a couple of clips of him in his Finchley gym and he's doing something, he's trying to hit something. He's like, I'm not that good a boxer, you know? And he kind of laughs. It's almost like he's tried to become a great boxer mm -hmm. and it's either there or it's, it's not there. Like they, they've removed the wrecking machine from him and tried to make him like almost be a bit too fine and too, too clean. And I think they've tried that with Boazzi as well, but it's not quite work because Boazzi is still very yeah. rough. And I want Boazzi to stay where he is. I don't mm -hmm. want him to become a clean, I, I don't want Virgil to turn him into Andre Ward. Mm -hmm. I want him to be a wrecking machine still, but we'll see what happens. Cause I think Richards is going to cause him problems, but I'm like you, Boazzi should be fighting for a world title now. Mm -hmm. So he should be way above Richards, but we'll see. We'll see. I'm not sure with Boazzi, you know, we'll, we'll see where he is. Yeah, definitely. You, when you think of his ceiling, you think it's way beyond Richards, but when you actually think of where he is now, it's very equal. So it makes How it. How crazy really is that? Difficult. Yeah. And that's, that's no slight on Richards, but I thought, the only person I thought could have given him problems years ago was Yard. Mm -hmm. And now he's kind of with all of them. But actually he can't separate himself. Yeah. Like literally, some people don't even think he's the number one light heavyweight in the country. So he's got to look really good and then we'll see. Um, but I'm not sure. And he's going to hate me for saying this. He's, he's going to watch this video. I'm not sure that what I thought Boatsy was going to be three years ago, he will be. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure. I thought he was going to be someone that guaranteed world champion. I, I Honestly, I, I really did. Now, I don't know. I don't know. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I'm definitely with you. Um, on my channel, I did a video called like, I can't remember what I named it, but like I called it like the frustrating saga of Joshua Boazzi because mm. I followed amateur boxing really closely and I saw some of his wins in the amateurs and he was winning fights against certain opponents in the amateurs that British amateurs just don't win. And yeah. we put it down to, oh, it's a Ukrainian, they're a Cuban, they're brilliant. Boazzi was winning some of those fights and I always thought that he would just have something special that perhaps some of the other Olympians of the 2016 crop wouldn't have. Yeah. And up to 2019, and I always think of 2019 so clearly, he had that Liam Conroy fight for the British title where he yeah, looked spectacular. Well. He just destroyed him. He had Marco Antonio Paraban on the AJ undercard. Again, looked really good in that fight. And then he had the Ryan Ford fight on the Loma Campbell undercard, and I was there. And it was a bit of a, straight, a frustrating fight. It was like That's a low blow. That's the a few low blows. Yeah, the low blow. And then just ever since then, nothing's ever seemed to flow for Boazzi like it has. Nothing's clicking. No, it's almost like it's exactly. not clicking. And he obviously he's gone to Virgil in the hope that it will click. Mm -hmm. And you just, you wonder though, like, like when you got that, just that another level, just a little bit. And that's what he's done when he thought, was it Kalich? Yeah. Like, or where he's ice And that's just, Ryan Ford and Kalich were just another level above Periban and Liam Comroy. And you think, yeah, like yeah. surely you get past him easy and he's not he struggled a bit and i i don't know man i'm not quite sure i'm not i'm not sure put it that way i'm not sure like now if you make a yard boatsy fight I, I would still favor boatsy but before i was like oh boatsy all day now yeah, same as me now i'm not not as sure anymore mm -hmm. i'm not really and so yeah this is a big fight for him he's got to look good it, a win i don't think just a win's enough he's got to look mm -hmm. really good so we can then kind of start praising him again we'll see yeah He's got to separate himself, definitely. Yeah. Just before you go, Adi, the boxing schedule is so, so good at the minute. We're really lucky. There's a lot of great fights coming up and that's continuing. I mean, we looked at April and we're like, April's amazing, but now it's continuing to May and now it's <laughs> creeping into June. What fight is, every time you think about that schedule, what one is kind of sticking out on the page and you're getting excited for the most, would you say? Ooh. And I mean, there's so much to pick there's from. I mean, so Haney Cambosis really... I think that might be the that. one, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that might be the one. Um, look, Taylor Serrano is going to be fantastic. It's the big room at Madison Square Garden, so that's always going to be spectacular. Um, but if we're being brutally honest, I mean, this is a Taylor that's at the end, and mm -hmm. this is a Serrano that's had a lot of fights as well. So I don't even know if we're getting peak versus peak with both of those. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think with Haney and Cambosos, I think you are. This is I think this is what you're getting. You're getting Cambosos is coming off that amazing win against Tiafimo Lopez. You've got Haney that I think still got a lot to prove. Mm -hmm. I, I need to know if Haney's that guy. And I, I don't know if he is yet. Australia. I think I saw Camboso show the stadium, do a little walk around. And I was like, yeah. my God, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the one where I think it's a 50-50 fight, undisputed fight as well. 
I think that's probably the you know what I'm, I'm actually looking forward to it from a fun perspective. Javante Davis versus uh, Rolando Romero, I think that's his name, right? Yeah. Just from a fun perspective, yeah. anything could happen in that one. I think like Javante Davis will probably win by knockout, but I'm looking that one's going to be exciting for as long as it lasts as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's so many to pick from, but yeah, plenty, plenty to look forward to. Ade, thank you so much for joining me today, mate. Did you enjoy being back on? Bro, I loved it. And I, I, I want to say we should do this more often, but it's my fault, isn't it? But I like <laughs> it. I like being asked the questions. I always feel like I'm answering, so mm -hmm. I'm giving questions out. So it's nice to be asked, but I really enjoyed it. It's a shame that we didn't even get to talk about your Dinas Ugas Errol Spence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. It's been, yeah. it's we been got, that We've got five minutes. Can we do that? Yeah, of course we can. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. it. Yeah, so, yeah. So from my, I'll sort of give you my overview and sort of what I thought of it. It was the best version of Errol Spence I've seen. Um, there were some shaky moments in there, don't get me wrong, but the Porter fight and the Brook fight, and even the Danny Garcia fight is a bit of a weird one because it was a comeback fight, but Porter and Brook, although he stopped Brook, I never felt like he really separated himself from that level. He proved he was better than okay. Porter, proved he was better than Brook. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like Crawford, where sometimes you watch Crawford and he separates himself from that level and you just think, wow. Spence mm -hmm. has never really done that for me. But I did think against you, guess, bar in the sixth round, I did genuinely think, wow, he just seemed to have an extra gear and a point to prove this weekend that he just didn't seem to have in the past. Like his engine, he didn't have that against Danny Garcia. Like he yeah. was just constantly finding another gear to go through. And I thought he was really impressive. The volume, he's the sort of fighter that I like to say tests your manhood. He yeah. makes you really question whether how much you want this, whether you want to still be in there. And you just can't figure out how to sort of get around it once he gets into full flow. That seventh round, he was just really putting a beat in on you, Gas. So I was really impressed. There were some shaky moments in there. The sixth round, obviously, being one of them. There was a bit of confusion there. thought the referee handled it really poorly and that caused some doubt for both Spence and you, Gas. Mm -hmm. But... I'm now at a point where I sit here at a and just think about the possibility of Spence Crawford. <laughs> and like I don't think even as knowledgeable boxing fans like ourselves, we can comprehend how good of an actual fight no, that is. Dude, we're we're like, talking that that's an incredible fight. And yeah. I think someone tweeted me the other day and said, oh, but it's a 32-year-old versus a 34-year-old. I was like, forget that. Like, mm -hmm. Forget whatever you think about age now. Like, like you have to kind of just change your mind because athletes now are so much in better shape the food the, the nutritionist the dietitians the strength and conditioning work they do so a 34 year old Crawford is probably like a 27 year old from 10 years ago that's mm -hmm. just how they are Crawford lives the life as well um doesn't drink doesn't do any of that nonsense like this guy is a machine mm -hmm. and I'm with you uh, about the performance I think and not only that but 17 months out of the ring yeah like exactly. every other boxer is, oh, I wanted a tune up. Every other boxer is having a tune up. Crawford's like, no, sorry, Spencer's like, give me the champion. I want the champion. Ugas put up a brave performance. And look, he's going to have his moments, Ugas, because Ugas is a very, very good boxer. You know, mm -hmm. when you're, you know, when you've been taught the Cuban way, you know, you're going to be good. But Spence is just so physically strong. It's incredible. Like, I don't even know what he weighed in the ring, but he just look, he almost like, he's like he's been carved out of stone. Mm -hmm. and when yeah. he does the, I said it on my channel that when he does his body work I don't know many boxers that throw combinations to the body it's almost just your one shot mm -hmm. and then you go up head he stays on the body and it's and I think you've put it correct he tests your manhood yeah he mm -hmm. almost he's a throwback 60s 70s fight where it's not pretty he's not on his toes he's not doing the you know the, the Floyd May with a shoulder roll he is just going right at you and saying okay that's yours. I can take yours. Go on, here's mine. And mm -hmm. he is just, come on, let's have it. Let's have it. And yeah. you've got to be something special to beat him. Thank mm -hmm. God we have another special 147 fighter because we are, oh my Lord, it's going to be incredible. If yeah. Ugas versus Spence can do 40,000, because everyone keeps telling me Spence versus Crawford's not a big enough fight, ain't going to do the money. It will do seven, 800,000 buys and mm -hmm. it will do 50, 60,000. It, it, it will do. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's been talking about it. And I can't wait for it. I can't. Uh, to be honest, like every time we've spoke about it in the past, I've never really entertained it too much because I have felt like there's too much for them to overcome to make this happen. But now there's at a point where the, the path's been cleared. Obviously, Crawford's not with top rank anymore. He yeah. can go to PBC. And Errol did something on Saturday night that he hasn't really done before. 
don't get me wrong, he said he wants to fight Crawford. He said he would fight him and all this thing in the past. He's never straight up been asked the question, who next? And just gone, Terence Crawford, that's it. Take the mic away from me. That's who. On Twitter, when any people have been tweeting him, De La Hoya said about fighting Virgil Ortiz in Dallas. And he said, no, the only man I want to fight is Crawford. And you <laughs> ain't got him. So see you later. He's putting it out there and he's laying Bruh. it down. I've never Bruh. felt like it's going to happen. But I've my, got only, my only concern, and we'll end on this one, because my, I've got to go live in a minute as well. My yeah, only cool. concern is that now he has three belts. And now that he has a draw, and I'm sure his pay-per-view numbers are going to come back good, and he sold 40,000 tickets, something that Crawford's never never been anything close to doing. Crawford's never had free belts. Crawford hasn't fought the same names. The split's going to be a problem. Because mm -hmm. for me, you know, you do 50-50, but I don't... If I'm... Look, you couldn't... They couldn't do a split when Errol had two belts. Mm -hmm. Now Errol's got free, and he's coming off an Ugas win. It's going to be difficult to do the split. That's my only concern. Yeah. I you. think they should almost forget the split and say, Crawford, what do you want? And mm -hmm. Crawford says 10 and Errol says 20 and just don't tell Crawford what Errol's got. <laughs> like, just, you know, almost do it that way because they're never going to agree on a split because Crawford thinks I'm a freeway unbeaten world champion. Errol's like, yeah, but in this division, look who I've beaten. I've beaten all mm -hmm. the names. You've only beaten one. So that's going to be a problem. But if they can get over that, then I think they're going to get it done September, October. Yeah, fingers crossed. Well, Ade, I'm going to let you go because I know you're doing your live stream. But uh, yeah, Cheers, great to have you on, mate. Thank you for joining me. And uh, anyone can check out Ade's channel down below, so make sure to go and do that. But we'll catch you next time on the channel.